I want you to imagine there was this disaster. Like all of the Shenandoah County is, or Shenandoah area is flooded. And Jesus comes to lead a disaster relief program. Imagine like Grace Built Church is kind of the epicenter and he, he's here and he's sending groups to go take care of needs. Oh, hey, you guys go mop up that, the school. They really need those schools clean so kids can go back to school. Okay, oh, here's another group. Okay, I see that you've got shovels. Oh, you should go on up to the hospital. AMC, man, they need some people with shovels. And then he sees another couple volunteers. Oh, you're good at counseling. Well, I see that you've got this gift of just loving on hurting people. We're going to send you to that family over there where they're kind of stuck at home and they need just a person like you. And Jesus is there distributing these people. He knows exactly the project, the, the gift that that person has, and he sends them accordingly. And yet how silly it would be for you and I to be at home wondering, I wonder what God wants me to do. I don't know what God wants me to do. Why doesn't God ever tell me what he wants me to do? I would never know unless I show up at the work site and Jesus can give me orders. I got to show up to discover his will. This is the solution to you and I when we wonder, what is God's plan for my life? What's God's will for me? Well, you'll never know unless you show up. The, to discern the will of God is found by showing up, by, we shall see, surrendering to the Lord. Today, uh, in Romans 12, verses 1 through 8, we're going to discover how to discern God's will. Would you turn there with me? Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, that is, that you may know, that you may discern, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So let's condense that in kind of a, a layman's version. He's, he said for us, in my, in my words, maybe your words would sound like this, if you want to discern God's will for your life, then renew your mind in giving your life to God. So to know God's will for your life, you need to renew your mind in presenting yourself a sacrifice to him. In other words, it's not for me to have to uncover God's will. I don't have to polish it and make it, find it, and dig it up. And wow, I found, I discovered his will. It's right there. When, as soon as I say, Lord, use me, uh, I make myself a living sacrifice. And this is the art of giving your life to God. Why? Because he gave his life for us. So in Romans verse chapters 1 through 12, he's been teaching us. Hey, if you believe in my son, Jesus Christ, then the righteousness of Jesus Christ covers you. How did that happen? Well, Jesus gave his life on the cross. He gave his life for you, and you freely received it through believing in him. And so since now Jesus finds you through faith, if you believe in him, he finds you holy, accepted. So then it would be reasonable, he says, it's your reasonable service to give your life back to him since he first gave his life for you. So this is just the conclusion of everything we've been reading in Romans. He's saying, look, I love you so much. I gave my life for you that you're now holy if you believe in me. And now since I gave my life for you, what should you do? Oh, it's simple. Give your life for me. Present your life a living sacrifice to the Lord. Now, this is why Jesus taught us that it's better to give than to receive. Have you ever thought about that? Better for who? 
it's better for you. When I give my life to the Lord, I finally get it. It's funny, it's like when I look at my hands and everything that's in it, the time, the money, the abilities, the resources, when I look at what's in my hands and I think, oh, this is for me. I need to have this stuff and keep it for me. And in fact, I think I need more. But as soon as I look at what's in my hands and I realize it's for God, then anything in my hands, well, that's too much. It's more than enough. I need to get rid of it. When I think my life is for me, I'm stuck thinking I lack. I always need more because I, whatever I have in my hands, well, that's for me. I need more of it. I got to keep it there, make sure I don't lose any of this and get a whole lot more. But when I realize the stuff in my hand, my life, is not for me, it's not for keeping in my hand at all, I got to get rid of it then suddenly I not only have more than enough, I have an abundance. We have an abundance mentality when we give our lives to the Lord. But when we keep our lives for ourselves, we continually lack. And so Jesus says, oh, it's so much better for you to give than it is to receive. Because he knows in our hearts we're set free by the freedom of giving our whole self to Jesus Christ. Now, he says in verse 2 that it happens when we're not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Did you catch that in verse 2? Transformed by the renewing of our mind. So you and I are always being press, pressed by the world into conformity. I, I, I need more respect. I need more comfort. I need more health. I need to be better looking, more smart, uh, a bigger backyard, and so on, and so on. We're conformed into this neediness of the world. But by the renewing of our mind in this idea that we present our bodies to Jesus Christ, our life is not for us, it's for God. When we do that, we're fighting the conformity of the world, and we're being renewed in our mind. But do you notice he uses this term, this is an I-N-G, isn't it? It's renewing of your mind. This is like a continual process. This is the challenge with a living sacrifice. When you have a, a dead sacrifice on the altar, you never have the problem of it squirming off. <laughs> but that's what we do. I remember when I was, I was 23, living in Japan. After college, I graduated and got my first real job teaching English in Japan. And I went to Japan because it was the farthest I could go in terms of just this feeling, this nagging feeling that God was real. And so I thought if I could just go as far away to a whole different culture, a whole different way of life, I could escape this idea, this Western, I thought, idea about Jesus Christ and the Bible. Well, good luck running away because even there in Japan, I just found myself, I found myself reading scripture, going to church. Evidently, it's not an American thing, folks, because this Japanese church, it was about 20 people or so. The pastor was doing his best trying to, he saw my Caucasian face, and he started, he'd say a couple sentences in Japanese and translate it to English for me. And he was like, wow, a new face. This is wonderful. And he just taught the Bible. It wasn't glorious. It was, it was not Billy Graham, I'll tell you. It was not uh, anybody you might look up to in terms of like, wow, what a sermon. It was just the facts, and it was awesome. I remember not too many months after I started going to church in Japan, started reading the Bible on my own. I went on out to a pier at the end of this long, long pier in Osaka where I was living, and watching these airplanes fly into this island airport. And I, I just realized, it was like you see these lights and they just seem so lonely in the night sky. And that was me, so far away and alone. And I wanted to give my life to the Lord. And so that day, that night, I just surrendered to Jesus. And, you know, the next morning I woke up and I was still absolutely, totally a sinner. 
I still had those same patterns of life um, that took 23 years to build and probably took to take, it's proven to take another 23 years to relearn. I was still stuck in those ways of sin. I, I was still not holy practically <laughs> by any stretch of the means. But God looked at me as holy and acceptable because of Jesus. And God, even though I kept on squirming off of the altar, if you would, every single morning falling back into the old conformity of the world, but every time I, I said, okay, Lord, I messed up. I can't believe I did that. And yet you still receive me. You still... Look at me as usable. I got back up on the altar, you see. And that's what happens every single day. You're renewing your mind. When you say to God, here I am, use me at the missions camp. There's a work to be done in the Shenandoah Valley. Here I am, Lord, use me. You go carry your shovel wherever he brings you. But listen, when you report back the next day, he's going to have another work for you. He's never done with you. So you have to keep on renewing your mind every single day. Lord, use me. I'm willing to be used. Lord, I give whatever is in my hands, I give it to you. And in that renewing, that continual washing, you are, the word is transformed. Did you catch that in verse 2? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This transformation, it's interesting, this word transformed in the English is translated from the word in Greek, where we get the idea of metamorphosis. So it's a, a derivation. Metamorphosis is a derivation of this word here, transformation. Think about that transformation, that metamorphosis that happens when you actually say, God, I'm giving my life to you. Every single day, you're just waking up, Lord, I give my life to you. As it is, the mess that I am, but you find it wholly acceptable, I give it to you. What happens is you are like that caterpillar who just lives for its gut, eats all day, the hungry caterpillar, and yet it dies in a way, turns into mush in a hard shell like a cocoon, like a coffin. It literally turns into white mesh, mush, not unlike decay and death. And yet, that mush reconstitutes itself. It's transformed. It metamorphosizes to a whole new creature. No longer a creature of the land, of the earth and the dirt, but now a creature of heaven. It is of a new life. This is what God does every single day when you say, Lord, use me. And in that renewing of your mind, he gives you a purpose and a life in Christ. You're saying, Lord, I'm showing up today. What do you want me to do? This process of presenting yourself to Jesus Christ has never been more necessary. The Wall Street Journal, uh, delivered on Thursday this week, said to me that uh, two out of five Americans have uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression. That's higher than ever before. Two, four out of 10. That's eight, uh, 40 out of 100. How many more ways do I have to say that? <laughs> oh, we so many of us. One reason is we're stuck inside feeling useless. Now, God wants us to have a purpose. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 11, verse 29, that he has given us gifts and a calling, and they will never be taken away. It says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And in that gift that God, the gifts that God has given you, you will find your purpose. And I want to, I want to look at those with you today. So let's dive on in verse three. This is just the next verse, Romans 12, verse three. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, that's like we have many, a arm, we have a leg, we have fingers, there's each members of the body, right? For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then, verse 6, gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. 
So he's declaring just as a body has many different parts and each part has a different function within the body. So to every Christian has a function within the body of Christ. And he's just said, he declares in verse five that we are actually members of two bodies or that's two aspects of the body. One is verse five, we are one body in Christ. And then the other part of that is and verse five, individually members of one another. So you can think of us as Christians now, members of the body of Christ. So we have this aspect that we're connected to Christ. But as individually, we also have this aspect where we're, in, we're connected to each other, that we are linked to the body, uh, the individually members of one another. That's so important. Oh, man, it's so important. Because this is why God has given you the gifts. And so when we struggle with, oh, it feels so useless, it's because we've forgotten that our gifts are for our connection to God and for our connection to one another. It's how we serve and grow in Jesus. It's also how we serve and grow in the body uh, individually with the, the, the bride of Christ, the children of Christ. I want to give you so many, uh, there's so many examples in the Bible, I want to give you a couple. Because it's actually something we've seen in Scripture from cover to cover, that God gives gifts to people and he has a calling for their life, and that when they present themselves at the mission camp to be used by God, we now see those gifts realized. We see them now becoming the blessing that God wants them to be. Here's an example. There was a little boy named Samuel. He's, his, his story is there in the beginning of 1 Samuel. He was a young boy. He did not believe in God. He did not know God is the term the Bible uses. But he heard God's voice. Uh, God himself speaks to this young man and he gives him a message for a, another person named Eli. And the boy runs to Eli. He says, hey, someone's talking to me. And Eli says, go to bed. So the boy goes back to bed, but God speaks to him again. The boy doesn't know who God is. The boy doesn't believe in God. He doesn't understand he goes and brings the message again, or he doesn't know it's a message, but he says, he thinks Eli's talking to him. Or, what is it? What is it? Here I am. The boy is clueless, but he is hearing from God. And Eli sees through it, and he says, hey, boy, go back there. Next time you hear that voice, say, yes, Lord, speak. And so the boy now knows it's God. So he goes back, and he sits down in his little bed. God speaks again and gives him a message for, another, for, for Eli. And the boy obediently goes and gives that message. We don't know. Is that the moment he became a believer? Or maybe that came after. We don't know. But we know later on he certainly is a believer. He's one of the great judges of, the his, of Israeli history. And there he is sharing words individually from God to the king and to uh, young David and David's family. And then even to all of Israel, he's, he's a prophet but even before he had faith or knowledge, he was hearing from God. Do you see, he had a gift that was made manifest after he believed. He, find, he was always that way, I put forth to you. But now as he surrenders to God, it becomes his own. It becomes the mark of his life. Uh, Matthew, remember Matthew, he was a tax collector. That means he's really good with numbers and details. Oh, when Jesus found him, he was at the tax collecting table, keeping track of who's given how much. Okay, I'm gonna, you give government 10%. The Romans need this amount. Okay, I've got your name here. and making sure we get every single dollar from you. He likes details. So later on, Jesus, of course, calls him at the tax collector's table. And there, he surrenders his life to the Lord. How was he used later on? Well, think of all of the Gospels. There's four of them. Is there not one full of the details of the Old Testament? Matthew has more Old Testament details than any of the other uh, Gospels, by far. He's constantly referring to Isaiah and Jeremiah and making connections about the prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament, putting them in the New. He was a detail man, but a detail man from the Lord. And God used Matthew's works, his way of thinking as the way that once he surrenders his life to the Lord, how God will use him. Peter, 
he's there, the Bible says, he's casting a net when first Jesus calls. There's John, John the apostle. When he was first called by Jesus, what was he doing? The Bible says he was mending nets. Think about that. Uh, Peter, who would be the great evangelist of the book of Acts, preaches and 3,000 are saved in one day. 3,000 baptized. No one's preached like Jesus, or Peter, but Jesus. Jesus and Peter. <laughs> oh, but you see, he was, he was found casting a net. He was a fisher of men naturally. Or maybe it was supernaturally woven into him from before time. God just knew, I'm going to make Peter a man who can speak by my words, and people will get saved. He didn't know it. It didn't grow into fruition until he surrendered it to Jesus. Once he believes in the Lord, now he's preaching, and there's something that happens. God's working through his words. John was mending nets when he was called by God. John, later on, once he put his faith in the Lord, he's called the apostle of love, isn't he? He lived longer than any of the other apostles to, history says, 100 or more years. And there, to the very end, he was telling people, little children, love one another. He was always mending hearts. His ministry was loving and helping people to love in Christ. How he was found defined his giftings. And I want you to see, I want you to understand that when Jesus sees you walk in the door with a, the strength that he gave you, he's going to use that when you, when you let him, be, when, he, when you let him send you. The strength you have, it's really not yours until you give it to God. And now, finally, you have a usefulness. Do you have time? Uh, how long are you alive? Maybe you're in your 20s. Maybe you're in your 50s, you're in your 80s or 90s. God has given you a lot of life. Make sure you give it to him. How many children died before they were ever even born? How many other children across the world, across history, have died before the age of five? How, have you had a couple more years since you were five? Those years that God has given you, they're for him. The longer the life he gives you, the more strength he gives you. Do you have some wisdom? Oh, it's not for you. It's not for investing. It's for giving to others. It's not for impressing. It's for leading others by example, by the light that God has given you and through you. Whatever God puts in your hands, don't you see, give it back to him. And those gifts that God has given you are for your relationship to him and to others. Did you catch that in verse 5? It says, so we, this is Romans 12, verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually having members and individually members of one another. So when we're in our relationship with the Lord, our gifts are one of the ways we can offer back to the Lord. Oh, I have some strength. I have some time. I have a mind. I have some abilities. I have um, some gifts and I can give them to the Lord and it blesses the Lord. It blesses me. I also am a member individually with one another. So as a Christian, I not only relate to Jesus by giving my gifts to him, but I relate to Jesus by being a part of the body horizontally, individually with the other believers. Both are necessary. What keeps me from relating to others or giving to God? It's pride. Verse 3 says, um, read, read it once more with me, Romans 12, 3. I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And so my pride is what keeps me from either giving to God my gifts, I keep them for myself, or my pride keeps me from being a member individually with, with you all. And so we see this all the time. It's so easy for us to keep our gifts for ourselves, to make ourselves richer, to make ourselves more comfortable, to make ourselves better in our own sight. Or we keep our gifts to ourselves and we, we, we withhold it from the brothers and sisters, God's children. It's really important for us to understand when I don't want to go with, be a part of the church, the bride of Christ, when I don't want to be a part of organized religion, um, it's, it's really just pride. Remember, verse 3 just declared it's, it's just, I think, too much of myself. When I think of you all as uh, just a bunch of fill-in-the-blank, it's because I think I'm more than I am. Rather than being a, recognizing I'm a sinner, 
saved by grace. I tend to think the Christians are just a bunch of un unwashed masses. Churches are for people who are fill in the blank. And I think less of you when I say to myself, I don't need to be a member individually with the body of Christ. The individuals. It's my pride that keeps me away from loving the church the way God died on the cross to make me love the church as he loves the church. Have you ever tried a loving a man and hating his kids? How close can you get to him? <laughs> you can't. Or a, my, my wife, Claire, you, do you like me? Well, you better be nice to my bride. This is just, it's just our nature. And so when we say, oh, I love Jesus and I read my Bible, I'm really not, I'm not loving the Lord. Oh, I, I, I love Jesus, I, I pray. I'm, I'm really not loving him. Because if I look down upon his bride, you all, if I look down on his kids, us all, I'm looking down on Jesus. And so you and I, we must uh, raise the bar on our humility. Jesus teaches us that the church, his bride, his kids, it's really not about having friends. Sometimes uh, it's always been easy for us to say, well, rather than being a part of the church, using my gifts within the church corporately, I'm just going to have some Christian friends. When I, I need some Christian friends, by the way. You, we all do. And I need to love on them whenever I can because it's nice to be around people I like. But the church is not people I like. The church is people God likes. And so we got to have some time when we're together for no other reason but because we love Jesus. And so we all wouldn't maybe know each other or have much in common apart from Jesus. But when we look aside from our differences and we gather because of Jesus, it blesses him. And now we're able to operate in our gifts. So the very gifts that God has given us, we use. And I want to walk through those gifts with you today. Uh, the, the rest of this passage will show some of the role, some of the gifts that God gives you. And I believe that many of you have these gifts already, even if you've never believed in the Lord. But in surrendering to the Lord, you'll find these gifts have always been there. Or maybe they're developed and blossom, well fertilized as you surrender your life to the Lord. Let's take a look. So the first one is in verse 6. It says, verse 6, uh, so he's continuing. He says, let us use them, having the gifts differing according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. Number one, if prophesy, or if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. So Samuel, remember, he uh, heard a message from God for somebody else that was going to encourage and correct and help another person. And so it took a lot of faith for little Samuel to say, okay, I think that's not indigestion. I don't think that's just a weird dream. I think that that could be from God. And I'm going to have to use faith to share it to the person who it's for. And it isn't until that little boy stepped out in faith, said, hey, Eli, I think that God wants you to know. And then Eli received it. And so then Samuel saw, oh, my faith was made real because now I see that God had a message for somebody and he used me as the messenger. And this is what happens through prophecy. It's one of the gifts that you probably have. I think that more of us have prophecy than we know. In fact, uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 12, 13, and 14, Paul says, I wish that all of you um, uh, would speak in tongues, but more than that, I would that you prophesy." So this, he's showing that this is something that is for so many of us, that, but we hold back. Because every time we gather with other believers, God does not want to just speak through a pastor. Oh, we're all so hungry for the Lord. Because maybe we're just hearing from a pastor. You've got to receive words from each other too. You know, the other day someone came up to me at the end of the service. Hey, I've got a word I want to share with the church. And it, it might have been prophetic. I don't know. But the solution for that brother isn't standing up in front of everybody necessarily on a Sunday, but going right to the person who God gives you the faith to share it with and sharing it with them to lovingly, gracefully, humbly. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've been ready to give up and quit until somebody came up with an encouraging word. And once I heard the words, I knew 
that was from God. It wasn't from that brother or sister. And one thing I have found, though, there are some of us who feel this often. Many of them are here in this room today. They just, sometimes they'll, they'll come up to me or they'll just say to someone they love, I think God wants me to tell so-and-so. Uh, and you know what you need to tell them? Go do it right now. Don't stop. Call her. Get him on the phone. Go meet him for lunch. And you give him the message and you won't know if it was from the Lord until you share it. So it takes faith for us to operate um, in, this, in any of the spiritual gifts. But, but this is one that I've found that many of us have even before faith. We, we've heard the Lord talking to our hearts, even as kids. Were you that one? And then after you came to faith, you came to realize it wasn't just for me that God talks. It's for my children and my grandchildren, my boyfriend, my girlfriend. God wants me to share words with others in trust that it might be from God. So let us use it in our faith. In our, let, let us prof- prophesy in proportion to our faith. Verse 7, or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. So ministry is a fancy word for serving. You could say, let him who sweeps the floors after church sweep the floors. Let us use that. Let him use his gift in sweeping the floors. Anytime you do, you wash feet as Jesus did, you're just serving behind the scenes. There's no glory. There's no uh, pat on the back. There's no parade for you. No one even knows it. Now you're ministering. And some of us have that gift. Perhaps all of us have that ability, and certainly all have that calling, but some of us are just naturally good, supernaturally now through faith, good at giving our time to others in the name of the Lord, and then through what we serve, even just sweeping floors, um, cooking food, uh, listening to a hurting brother or sister, as we're just serving that simple way, God gets the glory. God is receiving a gift from our hands to him, and the body of Christ is growing. The body of Christ is blessed in Jesus. So don't ever think that she or he has got a gift and you don't, because that person is speaking and you're just sweeping. It's not like that. In God's economy, the one who's washing feet has just as much of a spiritual gift, will have just as much of a reward in heaven, has just as much fellowship with Jesus as the one who might have a gift that's flashier. Next, it says, verse 7, he who teaches in teaching. So some of us will have the gift of teaching, and we ought to use that spiritual gift of teaching in our teaching. But let's be clear. Very many people who were uh, before Christ had a gift to teach. They now in Christ have ability to teach by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so some people just have a mind that helps people, whether you're teaching algebra or teaching the doctrines of our faith. uh, Now you find that that natural inclination to break things down simply is transformed and glorified by offering that to the Lord. And whether this be in a Sunday school class, uh, gathering with other believers in your home, or whether it more often is just one-on-one. There's a brother you're working with. He's covered in dirt. You're covered in dirt. And you're like, we're tired, but I just want you to know. I I feel like I want to help you understand that this is the way God is. And even if it's a three-sentence teaching, absolutely the Holy Spirit wants to be a part of that, and the Holy Spirit wants to speak through you as you're teaching people about Jesus Christ, especially other believers. And I also want to say on this, perhaps we need to be reminded that we must not let ourselves go to a church or turn on a YouTube channel or um, watch TV if you have one of those just because that guy teaches the Bible um, inspirationally or he motivates you, or she motivates you. That is not necessarily the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching is more than inspiring, it's empowering. Just because he or she speaks with the tongues of angels does not mean they have the love of Christ pouring through them. You must let yourself have a teacher. Let, if you're learning from another brother or sister, personally, 
or on a digital format, as good as that may be or bad. Don't just be amazed by their words or their intellect. It's not necessarily teaching in the Holy Spirit. But there's got to be a, a gift of the Holy Spirit in their life for you to surrender your knowledge to. You're going to learn from that, brother. May it not just be because they have impressive words or flashy lights or what a video team. It's because God is speaking through them to you. You leave not just impressed, but you know more about Jesus. You're transformed in knowledge of who God is. Now you're empowered for godly living. Next, it says in verse 8, uh, he who exhorts in exhortation. So exhortation is a fancy way, an old-fashioned way of saying encouraging and building up. And so when you and I um, have an interaction with another brother or sister, don't make light of it. If you feel like, oh, well, I didn't really have God speak to me to say, go tell so-and-so that. But you're just having a heart-to-heart with a brother or sister after church or before work. Maybe you gather with kids at Waynesboro High School at lunch to pray. And when you're doing that, you're encouraging each other. You're exhorting one another. Don't think that's less than what any other man or woman does. For God uses exhortation in the same Holy Spirit-powered way as all the other gifts. Next, it says in verse 8, he who gives with liberality. And so here we find that giving is something, of course, all of you, we're all called to encourage, right? Jesus said, you're a light on a hill. We're all called to teach in one way or another through example, if not by word. We all are called to, um, to give as well. But some of us have a mentality of giving with just joy, or as he says, with liberality. Just, whew, whatever God gives me, it's just like, it doesn't stay in my hands. It just goes, whew, whatever I have, I want to give. Some of us have just that special gift. Some of us go to college with the idea of, I'm going to go get a great degree and get a great job, and I'm going to give, the more money God gives me, I'm just going to support the gospel. And some, it's just a gift. They make like four times as much as I do or you do. And whew, they're just giving to the Lord, supporting churches, Churches that would have been blown away like the wind are, are, are growing, are satisfied, are thriving. How? Well, God gives some of us this gift of liberality in part because he just we have more, more resources. Um, now, I want you to put yourself in God's shoes for a moment. So if you, if you were God and you saw there was two people, one person gives to the Lord just faithfully, generously, whatever God gives him, uh, he just gives a portion, a generous portion to the gospel. And then the other person uh, keeps it all for himself. So if you're God, which one are you going to give a raise to? If you're God, you know the churches need to continue in the gospel. Uh, you, you, God sees all of the needs. One person is giving of his resources generously to the gospel, and the other one keeps it for himself. So if you're God, which one's going to get the raise? Which one's going to get the promotion? If you're God, which one is going to, no matter what, you're going to keep that one having a, a consistent income, a consistent blessing him with resources, blessing her with resources. Why? Because you know where it's going to end up. And this is what God does. It's no mystery that when God sees that we are givers, he, he makes sure we never lack. It's just the truth. Uh, if you haven't experienced it, you can in a moment. Just give. And as you give, you will find that God always gives more. He who gives with liberality. Then he says in verse 8, he who leads with diligence. Are you one of the leaders in the nursery? Maybe you're a leader at your office where people look to you and they know you're a Christian and your example affects others. Are you a leader... Um, in, in, at your, in your family, with your children, they look to mom or grandmom as uh, their model of what a Christian looks like and acts like and behaves like. So you're a leader. I want you to understand you will need the spiritual gift of diligence. Here we find he who leads needs to do it with diligence. In other words, the higher, more people are looking at you, the more effect you have on others, the more likely you will have the feeling to quit to throw in the towel. And so for you and I, moms and dads, uh, leaders at work, servants of the church as leaders, you have to constantly let the Lord give you the diligence to keep going. Next, 
It says, after he who leads with diligence. It says, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so there's that giving of grace to one another that builds the body just as much as a prophetic word from God to another or teaching faithfully. Those things wonderfully can build up the church. Oh, how we need givers to give liberally. In the same way, we need those who have been wronged to show mercy and do it with cheerfulness. The church can't grow. We as a body of believers can't be healthy. We can't gather in Christ's name, keep on worshiping the Lord every Sunday, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We can't be the Christians we ought to be if you and I don't give mercy to each other. Now, some of us have a special gift for that in that we have been wronged. And how we respond to that wrong, as dire as it is, and how we respond, respond to that wrong is how we're going to build the body. For when they see, when we see you forgive and turn the cheek and just move on in your life and not even look back to that bitterness and that sorrow that, that another Christian perhaps did to you. When you show mercy and you do it with cheerfulness, you don't even look back. You're just filled with grace now. You don't even want to talk about it anymore. Let's move forward in the Lord. When people see you have a merciful heart, they'll give God the glory. The church can continue. The, the word of God flourishes. So every, each of these callings that the Lord has for us, they're gifts that God gives you, callings, role for you. You need to find your place. Find which one is especially built for you. I want you to think about the animal kingdom. If you were to go to Africa and see, go on safari, and there's the elephants, and there's the giraffes, and there's the uh, <laughs> cheetah, and all the others. And there, there's all the animal kingdom. Now, all of those animals have four legs. But one of them was just, as soon as he gets up, he, zero to 60 in five seconds or so. I mean, he's just gifted with speed. I mean, it's easy for one of them to run like the wind. Now, the elephant takes a little while to get up to speed. Maybe a giraffe needs a little more motivation. But for the giraffe, though, they're all given four legs. They all can move. For the giraffe, it comes naturally. That's how you find your gifting. You know, mercy, leading, giving, we're all called. To those things. Prophecy, I, Paul says, I would that all of you did. You, we all are called to these things. They're aspirational, but you have empowered by the Holy Spirit if you believe. When you say, Lord, I'm showing up, send me. Lord, here am I. Use me today. When you renew your mind, you are transformed into what God wanted you to be all along in fullness and in his glory. And so, what is it? I, I can't tell you. But when you try each of those things, you just try leading, showing mercy, giving, uh, sharing a prophetic word. When you, when you try those things, you'll find that one of those you will fly from zero to 60 in three and a half seconds. You'll see that one of them is more natural for you. It's supernatural again. So let the Lord use you. When you show up, He's going to give you something to do, and you will find it's perfect, it's acceptable, it's good. It seems like it's just the right one for you. It's what you were made to do. Find it, and then flourish there. Now, you might say, but Josh, I think I have more than one. Good. You probably have seven of them or more. Use them all. Use them for Jesus' name. Use it for how you can relate to the Lord and how you can bless the others.